When Jesus spoke, he often said things that caused people to stop what they were doing and have to think about what he's saying. Because when Jesus spoke, they were things that were not easily, they're easily heard, but they're not easily understood, and they're very directly confrontational. They cause you to do one of two things, either accept or reject, or to question, or to seek to understand, because you can't get around the aspect of what Jesus said and what he meant, because it's directed at you. It's personal to you. It applies for you. And it always comes directly into your heart and causes you and I to have to make a choice. Now, over the years, people have adapted what Jesus said. They've, some and very few, adopted what Jesus said. But most of all, they have spiritualized what Jesus said to put it into some kind of category that's out here in a mystical way, that it's a high idea that we can never quite grasp, where we can't reach to, we can never attain. That it's always got to be, with what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, something to stretch for but not grasp. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 of Matthew. He was speaking to his disciples, but the crowds likewise heard. The fact that they heard is contained in verse 7, 29, and, eight, and 28, because it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished, not the disciples. They were astonished too, don't get me wrong, but the people were astonished at his doctrine because he spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes would always say, thus saith the Lord, or the scriptures say, or the prophets would say, thus saith the Lord. The scribes would say, it is written. And Jesus spoke contradicting the scriptures earlier, and later we'll read about that when he says, you have heard it said, or it is written. And then he says, but I say unto you. The reason why he said, I say unto you, is contained in... 724 when he says therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and does them I will liken unto him as a wise man who built his house upon a rock and then he says and the man who doesn't do these sayings of mine will be a foolish man who built his house upon a sand but even before that he said there are those who are going to come to me in that day and say Lord Lord have we not done these marvelous works in my name in his name and he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So the key issue is we can't spiritualize it. We can't put it as a pie in the sky. We can't put it off as though it weren't something that made the difference between Torah, Mosaic, Judaism, as recorded by the scribes and the Pharisees and as exemplified in the religion of Judaism as adamant for orthodoxy, as stringent as it could be or as liberal as sometimes it's made to be by men, but rather it was the Son of God, the Messiah himself, the lawgiver, the prophet, the teacher, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob speaking and saying, these sayings of mine are what you are to do. What you will do, I do not know. But for me, I know what he says is what he means. And what he means is what he said. And so we looked at previously what meekness was. And it's not a matter of being weak as though, you know, you got to be meek and lowly and you got to be beat upon and, you know, just destroyed and wiped out. Because Jesus was meek. Now, you could call God meek if you want to because we can threaten God. We could blaspheme God. We could say all manner of names against God. And while he waits to bring judgment, because of his love, he hesitates to cause our stupidity to be judged immediately so that we have opportunity to repent. In that way, his meekness is complemented by his love and his patience. Because God, as Jesus is called meek, is the personification of who God is in the form of Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God, and he said, if you see me, you see the Father. So, meekness is not 
weakness. Weakness is a concept that is lost over the ages in the Western civilization because the West is always taught to conquer and they look for heroes and they look for being the John Waynes and look for the one person who's going to be above it all rather than, as Jesus said, who is our the love of our life, I give glory to my Father which is in heaven. So that meekness is an ability to give over to another the glory that's due them when it could be bestowed upon ourselves. That meekness is the choice to be something other than what we ascertain to be the American dream of asserting our, our virtues and our rights and our privileges and standing up for ourselves. Meekness does not stand up for itself. It entrusts itself to someone who will stand up for them. And that's what meekness is. Turning yourself over to the one you trust. And that had better be God. Because otherwise, you will find that you're serving and being subservient to something that's going to destroy you and you've been deceived. So, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But that meekness I just described is the fruit of the Spirit. The meekness here is different because, you see, it isn't something you become. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek were those who had been beat upon, who had been put upon, who had suffered in silence or even in crying out to God in agony for deliverance because the Messiah had come. And he is speaking to those who had waited for the Messiah to come. And he were crying out for deliverance from Rome. God, get us away from these Roman conquerors. They have destroyed your house. They have abused your priests. They have changed the law of Moses into the law of Rome. And peace is only Roman Pax, Roman peace. And we have lost our way. God, deliver us, we pray. And Jesus said, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Because they would not assert themselves to become zealots and take up the sword and conquer, or they would not take, as it were, the meekness, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and then suddenly be able to run out and conquer, as we have seen Christendom do sometimes in religious zeal, without religious authority of God in it, but claiming that God told them to kill. Meekness does not kill. Meekness is patient. Meekness is an aspect of love. Meekness is that place that God has created in a heart that has suffered, that has chosen to give over its rights to the one who can cause them to be inheriting the earth, for that is what God created those who are meek to have and to hold, which we all should attain to. But the ones he spoke to now, were those who were oppressed, who had been beaten down, who had almost lost their hope. Because the same word that means meekness also means those who are oppressed. And so, as God applies, when you read the word, we know that the Holy Spirit will customize it directly for you so that you will hear the Holy Spirit using Jesus' words to come directly to you. If you're prideful, then he wants you meek. If you are oppressed, then he wants you lifted up. You see, that's the only way that God can apply both meanings of the word meek and still have it fit completely in a perfect picture. Because the Holy Spirit causes you to remember the things that Jesus said. He doesn't just give you gifts. He gives you those gifts to operate so that you can know Jesus and the Father and be unified with them in their meekness, in their oneness, in their unity, in their echad, as it says in the Hebrew that they are one, and that's why we have one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. They are Echad, they're one. So, when you think, and when you read, and when you meditate on this as you do devotionals, because you have to think about it, you have to go, meek? What is meek? Is that weak? You have to think of a gentle giant. You have to think of strength contained, but reserved until the time that it is released or told to exercise itself. And in reality, you were created by God, so you turn everything back to God so he can exercise himself on your behalf. Because if you exercise your own authority, you're on your own, literally. 
But Jesus wanted those who were oppressed to know, as well as those who were blessed to know, that they shall inherit the earth. For there is a time of peace coming, and Jesus spoke of that. In being the Messiah who came, he would also reveal he was the Moshiach who was coming to set up the kingdom for Israel to enter into that thousand year reign where he would rule. And when he does, meekness shall be accomplished in us as we are directed by him to follow through with what he said to do in these sayings of his. So if you lack meekness in your life, ask God. If you want to be blessed and hear the bracha as it is spoken of in Hebrew when they say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Blessed art thou, Lord, our God, King of the Universe. If you want to hear a bracha made of you, in you, as a living blessing, to become to others that bracha that God has made you out of, which is what the Hebrew idea was supposed to be in the first place, but they made it into a, a tradition and they made it into a word and into an action, but not into a living being. But they said the words were living, but they forgot that the being himself, you, are that living blessing. You are the bracha of God. You are the blessed of God. You are the blessing to be meek to others that they may see your meekness and inherit with you the earth. For Jesus has come to give us a living way. He is the halachot, the halacha. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What are you going to do with what Jesus said?